Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. So uh, you guys have a new record coming out, you know, Digital Noise Alliance. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, it seemed like it was going to be a while, but, you know, that's coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, I know. Time flies. Well, it does. But you guys have been busy, you know, yep. and, then, you know, you put out a few clips. Uh, I think the, the recent video, you know, for Behind the, the Walls, uh, I yes. like it, performance slash concept video. Tell me about that, because that song has a very classic modern Reich vibe to it right i mean the whole uh musical aspect of of dna uh as an album you know i think people are gonna hear the organic uh, uh elements of it and the respect of the uh the past um me as a guitar player original guitar player that recorded all those albums um you know, there, there's a good chance it's it's going to sneak out some ideas and some spawn some, uh, uh, you know, things, riffs, you know, songs that, uh, you know, remind them of the uh, the legacy days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's um, and because this album was kind of recorded uh mm -hmm. In a similar way, it's like back in the early 80s when we'd all be in a room and we'd be showing each other ideas and learning riffs and putting things together. You know, this album was was kind of like that as well, you know, but done more in, in the uh, digital age of uh, computers. <laughs> so, so did it. So are you saying that the record kind of had this kind of uh, vibe of back in the older and old old days? Well, the thing is, is that, you know, we can we can be in a situation where we write whole song ideas and email them, mm -hmm. you know, and the uh, problem with that is that, you know, you got to attach the email, you got to send the email, you got to wait for the recipient to respond to the email, right. the recipient has to listen to the idea, and then get back to you on their time. Okay, that can take, you know, a day to a month. <laughs> right. With right. this, you know, it, it expediates ideas. Um, and it's, uh, so it, it, in, in a sense, it was more improvised and built organically because they were basically riff ideas that I came up that were just conjuring up in my head. Right. And I just have our producer, Zeus, you know, hit the record button because I got something. And then the guys in the room would, you know, give it thumbs up or thumbs down or whatever. You know, we had uh, an electronic drum kit in the studio. So Casey Grillo was there. And if Zeus said, hey, play a play a, a beat to this riff, you know, and then Todd would go, hey, I got a melody for this. And Ed go, I got a bass part. And the songs were built that way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they were cataloged into right. Pro Tools. So once we exhausted all the ideas, we'd go on to the next riff. Yeah. Nice. Uh-oh. This is the guys. And uh, so it. Um, I think it, it just uh, expediates everything. And... When it's all said and done in the, the four or five sessions that we had, we had over 20 ideas, 20 song ideas, mm. you know, and then um, so uh, I think it's a great way for a band to to write. Uh, we can get, you know, comfortable and lazy and just send, you know, Internet emails or we can get together in a room and everybody, you know, is there on their A game, throwing their best ideas to build a song. Right, right, nice, cool. So, I mean, I, I think uh, the records that you guys have released, cause this is number four with Todd. I think right. at this point, you know, you guys have kind of almost gotten to the point where if you wanted to, you could basically do a, a, a set of just hits from that era. I mean, 
I mean, it's incredible that some of the material that you guys have put together. I think that first album, again, you know, is is excellent. Uh, top to bottom, I really enjoy that one. You know, and and I think this record is probably, you know, probably equally as good, in my opinion. Right. I think, you know, just in doing the, you know, the press that I've been doing on this album, it's like a, a lot of everybody's really excited about Digital Noise Alliance. Um They've had time to ingest, you know, the songs mm -hmm. and, you know, they, 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 you know, I've heard, you know, Hey, this is top shelf Queensryche. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is, this is, I like this one more than the verdict. You know, it's, it's, I, I hear, you know, all different opinions right. and, and, um, but, you know, generally I think people are going to connect, you know, mm -hmm. and they're going to connect because the, the way, organically the songs were formed and they're going to, they're going to connect with the energy that was put into it. And um, I think, you know, that that's the big difference between this and the past three albums. Right. Out of curiosity, was that also how the, the first record that you guys did with Todd, the self-titled, is that how it was also put together just organically um, like that? Or was it a mix? No, it was, it was come together with full ideas okay. and, try and work through it so you know pre-production in the recording aspect is is about having the you know the 10 to 12 songs ready to you know embellish them and polish them with the first albums it was rewriting everything you know with the producer and, and taking this part to this part and this part you know and it was uh it was done that way. I mean, we were really mm -hmm. happy with those albums, but I'm just saying that this one is the first album where we've actually been in a room together and just like the early eighties. Right. Right. And, and I think, you know, the, the outcome is, is, is really going to um, excite people. Um, especially, you know, the, the people that are, uh, you know, ingrained with the legacy albums, you know, in their lives. So, uh, you know, what we'll, we'll, we'll see. We're really excited for this to be released um, October 7th. And, and uh, so far, so good. Ah, no problem. Hey, so you guys hit the road with Priest. I think you initially were going to uh, do a supporting role with Scorpion in Vegas. And then you got this opportunity. So how much did that mean for you guys to hit the road with Priest? I think that, that yeah, reception for you guys was awesome. We were very thankful because, you know, you know, let's, let's be realistic here. We just came out of a pandemic. Um, you know, you, clubs were closed. Theaters were, everything was closed for bands to tour, you know, and, and during that time you had a lot of bands that had recorded albums and they couldn't promote uh, by touring. So it was a bleak uh, time and, you know, for us, it was, you know, be safe and, and let's write an album. So um, for us to have a springboard back into the industry, which was just decimated by the pandemic, uh, we were very thankful, you know, to get on a tour with Judas Priest and, um, you know, start rebuilding you know, our touring again and seeing, you know, what the, the industry uh, has to offer. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just been a challenge, you know, uh, I think for all bands. And now, you know, you're, we're in a recession <laughs> and, right. um, you know, and for, for bands that, uh, you know, hire uh, tour buses, you know, diesel is, is, it's like three times as expensive as it was in 2019. So it's, the challenges are still there. It's, um, but obviously, you know, touring is uh, so important to hard rock bands and metal bands. And, um, you know, you, you have to, uh, it's almost like going back into the wild west. <laughs> it's like uh, there's fewer, uh, gigs available and but it's survival of the fittest and you know you just gotta you know you gotta bring your a game and be ready to you know 
adapt to the new frontier. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so how, how, how much, uh, time did you, how many, did you get a chance to watch the Judas Priest perform? How, how, uh, geeked were you about that? Um, oh, I, I, I'm so thankful. I mean, when I was a teenager, I was listening to these guys, you know, I grew up on them and, uh, you know, that their early albums and, and, uh, um, you know, all their albums. So, you know, we've, we've toured with them in the past you know, little tours that uh, where, you know, we've built a relationship with them and for us to, to tour with them is it's great. You know, they're, they're awesome guys. They're awesome musicians. It's, um, you know, Rob Halford is badass. You know, he's to me, he's like the definition of heavy metal. You know, he's just an intense guy. Right. And uh, um, so, and, and, and for the other guys, it's like, wow. It's like bucket list stuff. <laughs> right. No kidding. Um, you know, uh, as we mentioned, you know, you guys were initially supposed to support Scorpions and then uh, Scorpions ran into a little bit of a issue with Whitesnake bailing out. Did they reach out to you guys at all? Um, yeah, we, well, we've done uh, some touring with the Scorpions and, and we have a great relationship with them. And, you know, another band I grew up on, <laughs> you know, right. it was like, um I mean, those, those albums, Animal Magnetism, you know, it's, it's just uh, for us, the opportunity, uh, you know, you kind of got to take the, the best opportunity out there. Right. And uh, um, it's great that they still love the tour and um, you know, maybe our paths will cross again in the future. Right. Because we know they like to, to tour and um, you know, we, we have a great relationship with them. So how much does it mean for you guys to have Mike Stone back in the band? And, you know, he's has a lot of history with you guys and he's kind of slipped right in there seamlessly. Right. You know, when uh, Parker decided he was going to retire, you know, it was like, oh boy, here we go. Right. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but Mike was available and you're right. He's been seamlessly integrated into what we're doing he's a team player he's a uh, uh, great individual to just be around and you know it's it's all about uh recreating the songs to their true format and you know representing them in in their original way and for him, you know, the guitar parts that he's doing, it, that's what it's about. You know, he's he's motivated. He he's doing the research and woodshedding on all the the uh, guitar parts. And he's, uh, you know, instantly the the fans uh, accept him. And, you know, it's it's a great it's great to play with him. You know, he's he's a great player. And um, and he actually uh, recorded on some of the songs on the new album as well. Nice. Nice. Oh, great. So he's definitely featured in there. Yes. Nice. I, I was going to ask you a question because being that, you know, Queensryche has been a staple, you know, for me growing up in the Northwest, Oregon, you guys, you guys on uh, Rage for Order, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then work back through the EP and and uh, and all the other stuff there but um you know when uh paul allen opened up experience music project over in seattle they had this killer queensrike metal church display with queensrike i mean that's my band you know so how did he obtain that stuff and what's happened since because he's gone through a little bit of a shift in concept for that museum and even changed the name yeah, I mean, uh, back when that uh, the experience uh, museum opened up, it was it was really cool for us to you know be featured in a mm -hmm. way. So I guess you know their their people contacted our people. We basically donated um, guitars and jackets and and oh, whatever. Man. Yeah. So and you know I. Like you said, I don't know what what's going on 
these days, but I, I imagine all that stuff's in one of their uh, storage lockers or closets. <laughs> My God. Because it, it was it was Operation Mindcrime stuff. That's why I was really geek, you know. Because yeah. I caught that tour a couple times, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Wow! So they have they actually have ownership of that stuff here and the stage clothes and stuff. Yeah, it's it's been so long, you know. Who knows? You know, I don't know what they did with it. We, we need to find out where that's at. So <laughs> get it back. <laughs> Oh man, you know the other thing that's that hit me is it's the 40th anniversary of the EP. So how does that feel? I mean, I'm I'm starting to feel a little old and rickety here. Uh, it doesn't well, seem like I mean, a lot of people, you know, that that are discovering the EP, you know, and it came out in 1982 and it's like mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's they don't realize that, you know, shit, I was 19 years old. I was 19, 20 years old. Do you remember being 19 and 20? You know, uh, you're, you're, you're not thinking about right. you know putting albums out in 2022 you know <laughs> you're you're about like hey this is really cool you know let's do this so um for me it's it's uh you look back at it and i think you know there were opportunities and we believed in our music even at a, an early age like that and um you know took advantage of the doors that were being opened for us. And, and I think, you know, we, we had the mindset of rather than relish in our achievements, we were always thinking forward about what we were going to do next. And that kind of kept us grounded, you know, in our successes. Nice. You know, they did, I mean, after the initial run of that EP it was reissued, and they included the prophecy on there. What's the story behind that song? I love it. Yeah, I think that song was uh, written during maybe the warning recordings or or maybe after that. And because it, it, it had that, you know, raw guitar mm. um, element to it, you know, the record label added that as a, you know, a marketing thing <laughs> and it's right. like you know so so for us it's like okay cool um but it's cool to listen to you know the old 206 uh record pressings on your turntable nice nice before it went to digital to all cds right so i just got a couple more questions and i'll cut you loose mm -hmm. thank you for your time man um so uh, next one, you know, we don't get to hear a whole lot of, uh, or at least I haven't heard a, a lot of who influences you. Because, you know, when you think back to the material on the EP, it's like, what influenced that? You know, can you give us a couple influences in, in terms of the musician? Or the part that put into yeah, I mean, when I was a teenager, you know, living in Seattle, um, you know, you listen to the radio and it was all like, you know, hit radio, pop radio, and, and you know, I, w I was like into guitar, and loud guitars and angry guitars. I was, you know, mm -hmm. rebellious, you know, and I like, so we used to go to the record stores and, and buy all the imports of, you know, kind of the British invasion of metal. And so we were listening to Judas Priest, Scorpions, Accept, uh, Black Sabbath, you know, all, all these bands and um, really, uh, um, you know, listen to the bands that had dual guitar solos because that was like so exciting, you know, and it was uh, um, something that, that we latched on to. And, you know, so, I mean, the, the early stages, I think we were really influenced by, you know, a lot of uh, genres at that time. I think everybody, you know, for me, it's like I had a lot of, uh, progressive guitar players in my upbringing you know I, I used to listen to like Al Dimiola and John McLaughlin and um and then I had classical in my influences and I still to this day listen to Andre Segovia mm. on my uh, Google okay. play thing <laughs> oh wow nice okay um and you know so and but as a teenager I was like you know I was into Jimmy Page I was into um, and then when I was in high school, Van Halen came out and that was, that was it, you know, but there's so many different, uh, great bands that came out, you know, in the late seventies that, 
were popular back then. And, um, you know, I mean, to this day, I still listen to those recordings. Nice. Last question. So I was fortunate enough to uh, catch you guys when you did the pair of Rising West shows. I got the oh, show on yeah. Saturday. But what goes in? What goes through your mind when when you know those things sold out almost immediately? You have people oh. flying in from across the country. I ran into people that had flown in from like Japan and stuff. Oh, so yeah, that must was, have been mind blowing. It was, it was crazy. It was. You know, let's let's just do this because you know we're we're not doing anything. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, the outcome was incredible. I mean, uh, that Hard Rock uh, Cafe, both of those gigs. I mean, just it was they were both sold out. They they sold out of all the beer in the place. <laughs> right. right. We sold every T-shirt that we had. And the fans were just going, oh, my God, Queensryche is back. They're playing the old stuff. They're playing, you know, and, uh, you know, the word just spread like a wildfire. I mean, and, you know, the next show, there were people flying in from L.A., management companies. And, and you know, it's like, wow. And it happened so fast. It was so exciting. And, you know, who knew that was just going to be monumental in the recreation of Queensryche. Right. It was awesome. It was worth the four hour drive in. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, well, thank you for your time. I, I hope to see you again uh, down the road and speak with you and definitely see you on stage performing somewhere in Portland, Oregon, you know, in one of the venues there. But uh, thank you for your time. Best with the record. And we'll get this online and give you guys links. All right. Thanks so much. And uh, appreciate the support. And uh, um have a great day. Thank you. Take care. See ya.